If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Where have you heard these words before? The so-called love chapter of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is a popular choice for weddings. This makes it both the most cross-stitched passage from the Bible and perhaps the most misinterpreted. If you Google 1 Corinthians 13 cross-stitch, you will find more than 1,000 results plus others under related craft projects. <laughs> Most craft projects omit the latter verses of the chapter, making it easier to misinterpret the passage as speaking solely of romantic love rather than the gracious, gritty, all-encompassing love God has poured forth upon us through Jesus Christ. Even though our portion from Paul's letter to the believers at Corinth can be properly interpreted and applied for a wedding celebration, it was read at my own, the original context to which it was directed was far less romantic and polished. Listen intently and do a careful reading and you realize this is no sentimental or cosmetic context. Paul writes to a congregation that he dearly loves. By the help of the Spirit, he founded the congregation at Corinth together with the hard work of local leaders. But Paul receives a report that this congregation has become divided and polarized. Several members boast about their loyalty to former leaders and evangelists. The wealthy shut out the poor from the potluck dinners or eat all the good casseroles before those who had to work late arrived. The Greeks relish their superior knowledge and knack for philosophical discourse. Particularly troubling for Paul are those individuals gifted with speaking in tongues who have become convinced that their gifts elevate them to a spiritual level above all the rest. And they begin to demean those who do not possess those same flashier gifts of spiritual piety. As he sits down to dictate to his scribe this portion of the letter, Paul realizes that the congregation at Corinth needs something far more lasting and profound than a crackerjack manager pastor who carries a Ph.D. in conflict resolution. Even that wouldn't deal with this. The divinely inspired word alone can effectively create unity out of division and communion out of the chaos of this congregation. Paul communicates to the exalted and humble alike through a carefully selected hymn celebrating the power of God's agape love. Greek scholars have studied this for years and have determined that Paul inserts one of the oldest Christian hymns into this portion of his letter. The congregation needs love, not the fluffy niceness in sentimental dress, but the God-given agape that cuts through to the nitty-gritty of human division. Paul writes of a love that lives for the other and dies to self for the sake of the common good. Paul writes that our love needs to be too big for envy or boasting or rudeness to gain a foothold. Our love 
needs to be big enough to bear with one another, to see the good in our neighbor, to rejoice in truth over convenient lies. In an era when so many would pit us against one another, when bearing with one another is not the norm, Jesus calls us to remember we are beloved siblings, and a beloved sibling cannot be our enemy. Our enemy is sin, death, and the power of the devil, and Jesus has already defeated the unholy triumvirate through his death and resurrection. So love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. For Paul, life in Christian community is not for those who seek to make the community into their own image. Yet it is the power of God's love to correct and redirect those who do try to make the body of Christ into their own image. Life in community is not for those who stand on its fringes and comb through the annual reports to nitpick things without also saying a prayer of thanksgiving. Yet it is the power of God's love to accept and direct those who do just that. Life in the community of faith is not for those who make their own hierarchies and choreograph their own unilateral dance. Yet it is the power of God's love to reconnect every member to the more excellent way of living a life of faith with the premier goal of building up the body of Christ. While avoiding any exact correlation between the congregation at Corinth and our own, there are major differences, including a span of 2,000 years. Let me say today that we, as God's love congregation, do stand as an inheritor of the Corinthian experience. We too are blessed in a metropolitan area with loads of energy and talent and with people who are from all parts of this country and different parts of the world. Yet we become in peril from time to time by the same friction and forces that lead to division, polarization over particular issues, and classification of ins and outs. We, too, are blessed with a tremendous supply of expert knowledge. We have some smart people in our congregation. We have people who work in biotechnical work. We have people who serve in police departments. We have people who teach all kinds of subjects in school. And yet we need to take seriously Paul's words in chapter 8. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. There's more to the body of Christ than just the head. Every one of us is bound to become disillusioned, as was Paul, from time to time when we discover vanity and stubbornness and bickering among ourselves. I read a passage from Dietrich Bonhoeffer from his little book, Life Together, to all of our new member groups that come through. The gist of this passage is, what are you going to do when you find out what we're really like? We shouldn't be surprised that we all have idiosyncrasies and things that pop up from time to time that get on each other's nerves. That's a part of what it means to be the body of Christ. No community of faith, this side of the pearly gates, is a pipe dream. That's why we place our trust in a God who delights to major in redeeming sinful communities and individuals. Part of the transformation brought by God's agape love into the congregation is the lasting joy that comes when we see our own sinfulness and need for God in the eye of our fellow worshiper. Lasting 
everlasting joy comes to us all as we discover that it is God through God's costly love who has brought us together in this place. Think about it. This is a unique combination of individuals. Why else would we be together except for the word of God? We wouldn't be together otherwise. It is by God's grace alone that we grow into a more vibrant community of faith, ever searching, ever hungering, ever singing. Yes, in the midst of diversity, in the midst of a congregation with high octane egos, in the midst of a community where we all find it tempting to sing our own song, dance our own dance, and clang our own symbols and agendas, there remains a deep unity in Jesus Christ, our Lord, formed by the word of God proclaimed and the word of God that comes to us in the sacraments. We are the body of Christ and individually members of that body. Divine love comes as a gift and quality of life to sustain us in unity and dynamic peace. Thanks be to God.